Action. So, um, at, in the following sessions, this council lasted not even a month, really. And if you think that, like, let's say Vatican II lasted, what, close to four years? And this lasted less than a month. So, they got a lot of work done in a short amount of time with no typewriters. Uh, or computers, well. Uh, on October 25th, uh, Emperor Marcion, so the emperor crosses equivalent of the uh, the bridge, right? And comes across the Straits, of the, comes across the Bosphorus there, and attends the solemn promulgation of the Council's definition of faith. So, if you've looked over that, that's and the papal legates got up; they were the first to sign it, and then 452 other bishops signed after them, saying that this this here, this definition of the Council uh, of Faith from the Council of Chalcedon was orthodox, that it was in conformity, it explained what the Nicene Creed meant. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, 452 bishops, do we have any idea like what chunk of the bishops in Christendom that was? Uh, no. <laughs> A hundred, well, in Nicaea, I think there was 1,600 invitations sent out to bishops. So this is later, this is 120 years later. But for instance, there were no bishops from Ar Armenia here. And um, one, of the, one of the churches or areas that does not accept, uh, did not accept uh, the teachings of Chalcedon was Armenia, saying, well, you didn't invite us, and it was so important, you would have invited us, so therefore, uh, can't be all that important, you didn't invite us. Um, <laughs> So, the, uh, have not, they, uh, have they, have they that? well, they were outside the empire. They were outside the empire, and uh, you had these not-so-friendly Persians in between them and the Armenians. So, uh, well, depending upon the time, depending upon the month, the Persians were either, the Armenians flipped back and forth depending upon who had the stronger army of the week. So the poor Armenians got trampled uh, relentlessly for centuries. In between Attila the Hun. Well, no, Attila the Hun, is, he's doing devastation now. Yeah, I mean, it's the 5th century. No one has it easy. <laughs> um, the bishops that the Robbers Council, two years before, had deposed, were then, uh, their cases were heard. And the first thing that they were required to do was anathematize Nestorius again. And he taught for the, so... Between 431 and uh, for the next 300 years, the 700s, anytime there's a problem, it's always good to re-anathematize Nestorius. It kind of builds unity. In uh, accepting the definition of faith. <laughs> yeah, and, and the Tome of Leo, which the council had never formally voted on. Uh, they were accepted, and those who did so were accepted back into communion with the Catholic Church. So two of those who did that were Theodoret of Cyrus, and we still have a, a number of his writings, a uh, very important church father there, and Ebus of Edessa. Now, he is a real uh, sympathetic towards the story. So this is one of the reasons that those in Egypt look at this and say, you've accepted the heretics back, you've sold out. Between October 23rd and October 31st, the council worked on 30 disciplinary counts. Uh, canons. One of these proved to be very controversial in themselves. So this is a lot, 30, uh, unlike the previous councils, where we looked at them individually and what they said. I tried to give a summary of them here because we wouldn't get to the end of them all. Um, the first canon said that canons issued by previous councils are to remain in force. Now this, for, if you remember back two weeks ago when we looked at Constantinople, one of the canons there said that the Patriarch of Constantinople is now second in prominence after the, after the Pope in Rome. And Rome never accepted that. So, the question is, how do you interpret canon number one? Uh, the, the, Constantinople accepted that canon. Rome never did. And, they, so this, and so that festering issue from before is now going to swell and create uh, more problems. Bishops were issued the follow the following canons were um, laid out for bishops. They were forbidden 
to sell ordinations. So the sale of, I'll ordain you for so many pounds of gold, a priest, deacon, or even a bishop, you know, um, this is a practice called simony. And we'll find it when we look at some of the councils of the Middle Ages. This is a problem that keeps popping up. The, you've got something people want, and you don't, you're, well, um, you know, fundraiser, another kind of fundraiser. Um, Another problem that we will see, not just limited to uh, the 400s here, but even in the Middle Ages, again, has to be uh, repeated once and again. Bishops, you're supposed to be in your home diocese, get back home. Um, so bishops who drift from one place to another, uh, more interested in vacationing than actually uh, administrating their diocese. They were uh, chastised, and penalties were laid out for them. And a third... Uh, canon was put out there was accepting clergy from other dioceses. So let's say, and one of the why why would they have this? I mean, today it's not that big of a problem. If um, Deacon Franco here wants to, you know, he wants to move to Indianapolis, he just contacts the or to Peru or wherever. He just contacts the uh, the local bishop and and applies to incarnate there and the local bishop might write back to where he's coming from. Are there any problems? No? Okay. It happens. Why was it a problem here? Well, we see cases like uh, Eutyches and other people, other priests and monks who are uh, clerics who are <coughs> creating problems in one diocese, they get in trouble and they flee to another. So this is kind of stop that from happening. Um, there was also apparently some uh, abuses by bishops here and there, maybe archbishops who oversee vacant, vacant dioceses until a new bishop is appointed. So if that diocese had the possession of various lands, right, and there were crops being grown on them, well, we'll just hold out and putting a new bishop there until this year's crop comes in. So that was uh, disallowed. And, uh, and finally, bishops were... Uh, told not to intrigue with civil authorities to divide the diocese. So if the, um, and this still works pretty much down to our present day, the diocese, the, the uh, lines of the diocese follow the civil lines. So most dioceses in the United States, there are a few exceptions, fall within the boundaries of a particular state, right? So we don't cross the river into Indiana, even though those towns are much closer to us than they are to Indianapolis. And so if you have a civil government that's, you know, oh, we're going to redistribute the counties and the diet. So that was to prevent that. Bishops were also required, and this was mentioned in Nicaea, they have to say it again because they haven't been doing it. Holding synods twice a year to look over any complaints that the, uh, you know, the laity and the, the clergy may have about how things are being done there. They are also to appoint auditors and accountants to look over their finances. Some problems are perennial. Uh, the clergy were forbidden, so this is like a wider looking to priests and deacons as well. They were forbidden from entering military service or taking secular offices, so being secretary of state somewhere or, um, you know, in, in the administration of some president. And we've seen even in Maybe you can remember back in 1983 when Pope John Paul II went to Nicaragua, right? There was a priest in the Sandinista administration who publicly scolded for doing, basically breaking this canon. So the priests and uh, clergy were forbidden to be involved in worldly administration of business uh, without special permission. And they were uh, required to receive an, uh, an appointment, a title, um, no more than one at a time. So what did this and the next one down where clerics were required to have a title before being ordained, what this means is someone has to pay for the well-being of the cleric, right? So the priest has to have a parish that he's assigned to, basically. There has to be one tied to him that will support him. And uh, that you can't just have priests and deacons free-floating out there and skimming off of whomever. They have to have a place to belong before they're to be ordained. 